Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. But now we are joined by PFF, the host of the Fantasy Football Show podcast, Mr. Ian Harditz. How are you doing? Great day, be great guys. Appreciate you having me on. Let's talk some Washington Commanders. I, you know, football team was fine with me, but we're going with Commanders now. I'm a big uh, USFL, XFL, AAF diehard, okay. so I, I feel like it's hitting home there. I'll take it. There you go. I, I'll eat that up all day, Ian. But my, <laughs> I saw back on the 18th of May, you had made a tweet, a video com- compilation of Carson Wentz's throws from last season with the Colts. Kind of to tell us to what to expect with Carson, because it's it's hard for us to be able to view him without having like you know the Homer goggles on. So as a somebody who is not in this market, that's not a Commanders fan, how do you how do you see Carson doing in this offense? So weird how that video was received. Like it's a good like minute thirty seconds of like legitimately high level throws, and instead of just appreciating that, everyone's like, oh, now show the bad ones, like show the low lights. And <laughs> I understand there is a low light video too, but like the hating Carson Wentz thing just because Colts brass can't go like more than a day without just throwing him under the bus <laughs> again. Know. Like, I don't know, man. It's just weird <laughs> how like, you know, they would win a game and it's just all oh, look how good Jonathan Taylor is. And then what Taylor do in week 18 run for like 70 yards against the Jaguars, but that doesn't matter. And we ignore the fact that, you know, Paris, shout out Paris Campbell from Ohio state, but like on fourth and season, Carson Wentz threw an absolute seed that should have probably been caught and like maybe could have changed things around. So I don't know. Carson Wentz obviously wasn't back to his 2017 near MVP level last year, but he was a hell of a lot better than he was in 2020. Thank God that was horrendous. Have nothing good to say about that 2020 season, but just with Wentz, man, he's objectively better than Taylor Heineke in just about everything. I mean, PFF pass grade, his quarterback rating, big time throw rate, yards per attempt, like whatever you want to look at and particularly downfield passing. And I think that's what that video showed off the Mm -hmm. most, man. Like Heineke was literally PFF's lowest graded quarterback on passes thrown at least 20 yards downfield. Shocker. Yeah, yeah, come on, guys. Oh my God, when he when he weighed McLaurin deeper on that one uh, and then oh my getting God. concussed, like bro, you think you're Mike Vick, like playmaker mode, trying to wave him back? Get out of here, bro. But uh, with Wentz, man, again, like he's not good, but we have this for some reason. Only in the NFL can you be like a top twenty, top twenty five person in the entire world at what you do, and then just be written off as like, yeah, he sucks. So hey, I'll take McLaurin, uh, Curtis Samuel, Jahan Dotson, and if the Logan Thomas is healthy, I'll take them over those weapons that were with the Colts last year with all due respect to Michael Pittman but let's not act like that offense was bringing the best out of Wentz so you know mm. it's just again it's just the, the Wentz hatred like I I get it if you're if you're Colts or an Eagle Eagles diehard fan and you know you wish you, your team would have been better that's fine but as you guys know there are a lot of players in the NFL that are far worse people than Carson Wentz that if you really <laughs> want to get worked up about I think you can maybe have those negative vibes uh sent elsewhere right right and one thing I'm so happy that you, you brought up uh Colts uh, owner and GM always bringing up Carson Wentz because I feel like we only really recognize that in the DC media. Everybody else kind of just eats it up. But here we're like, why do you guys keep doing this? It's like every other day. Just stop. Get over it. (laughs) But so speaking of Carson Wentz in the passing attack, what do you think of Jahan Dotson? Do you think that he's going to be a viable fantasy option this season? Yeah, man, he's going so cheap. And we were talking briefly just before the show. It's this weird phenomenon with guys like Dotson, Velas Jones, Alec Pierce, I think is another one uh, over there with the Colts, mm-hmm. where they go earlier than we expected them to. And instead of being like, hey, Washington thought Dotson was a top 20 player in the NFL, like they're probably going to throw him the ball a lot if they think that much of him. Instead of that, we're like, oh, that's a reach because this random guy on the internet told me that he actually was a should have gone like 50th. Because Walter Football said so. Yeah, exactly. It's like... <laughs> Come on. So, uh, like, if, if Dotson had not gone to the re- to Washington in the second round, I'm sure people would, like, would probably be thinking higher of him instead of him going in the first, which just makes no sense to me. So, That's a good you point. Know, 
I'm not bumping him up because of that one training camp video of him unguarded <laughs> jumping up. Like we can chill out on that side of things, but man, like you see him going right now of like several, several rounds past all the other first round wide receivers. And even the, like, the Christian Watson, Sky Moores of the world are going well ahead of him. So Dotson is someone that PFF really liked. I mean, just because of his suddenness, his ability to just win out of the slot. And, you know, he is someone that's pretty damn good with the ball in his hands as well. I hope Terry McLaurin, I hope he gets paid. I think he deserves that. T Curtis Samuel kind of did, but it's just tough to kind of tell where he is at um, health-wise. Like, non-zero chance that as early as next year, Dotson's racking up triple-digit tar triple digit targets with ease. Maybe even this year. What, I, you brought up Terry McLaurin. I wondered, one of my questions for you was going to be, what would be your guess for Terry McLaurin's contract? Obviously, yesterday, the Rams inked Cooper Cup to the uh, $110 million five-year deal. What do you think Terry McLaurin's going to get? Uh, I think he deserves to be in the triple, you know, getting that hundred million plus. And that's, you know, I know PFF grades, people have a problem with them sometimes. I don't think they can be like no, no single stat, not one stat out there perfectly encapsulates an entire player. So if sometimes PFF analysts are arrogant and are implying that, well, I can't speak for them, but I think it's a helpful, use, useful piece of the puzzle for someone like Terry McLaurin to help show how much better he is than his counting numbers tell you, because anyone that hates analytics, like they still talk about stats. They just, they draw some line at a point where they stop understanding what they're saying and they just say oh that's that's bullshit but let me tell you about yards per reception and whatever else they actually know <laughs> so like with terry mclaurin like he's been tw he, he was 25th since he's entered the league in yards per out run 35th in yards per catch 41st in yards after the catch 13th out of 102 players in PFF receiving grade. You guys watch him every single week. The route running he puts on display. This idea that like contested catches are like a sign of a lack of separation. Look no further than Terry McLaurin Thank to you. see that man. Yeah. There he had that touchdown against the Falcons. Uh, yep. I just tweeted a video. I was like, this is this one play shows you his entire career because right. Terry put this dude in the dirt yeah. with its freaking route running. I think Heineke was under a little bit of pressure there, so I'm not going to throw him fully under the bus. But basically, ball comes out like three seconds later, and Terry has to jump over a dude's back to come down with it. So right now, guys, uh, you know, you look at the quarterbacks in his career, and it's like if there is a pick for this generation's, you know, Andre Johnson, Allen Robinson, the baller wide receiver just held back by these quarterbacks, it's between Terry McLaurin and DJ Moore right now. Yeah. Mm. Love that. Definitely, definitely. I'm glad you mentioned that last part because – I hate when people try to nitpick about Terry McLaurin and say, oh, well, look at his uh, separation. Look how many touchdowns he gets. Look at his contested catch rate. The quarterbacks he's played with his whole career. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but um, so, so jumping back to another, another fancy football question, I've been a Antonio Gibson just like stand since the day that we drafted him. I thought that uh, he would be using the passing game a slightly a little bit more, but that might be due to circumstance, like other weapons, whatnot. But do you think that this is finally the year that – they use him a little bit more in the passing game. He gets those yards up in the receiving game as well. Gets his touchdowns up back to a uh, double digits again, like his rookie year. Because obviously they added Brian Robinson. They got some more weapons on the outside to kind of alleviate the pressure on him as well. In Gibson's defense, he was playing. He had that shin injury all season right. last year. He, he didn't look like the same guy as a rookie. Like that was the problem with all the. Gibson stuff last year. Everyone was screaming for him to get the ball more. McKissick was making better uses out of his touches pretty much all season long. I mean, we can go into the fumbles and that, but like just Gibson wasn't very good last year. And for them to add a third round running back in Brian Robinson, like that draft capital tells you that he is probably going to have a role. So I really hope some of the early murmurs out of Washington, it seemed like, wow, you know, we had the one day where JD McKissick was a Buffalo bill going on there, but they were saying even before that they were hoping to get Gibson more involved in the passing game. And I hope they do because as good as McKissick is, he does not need to be number two at the entire position and targets over the past two yeah. years behind only Alvin Kamara right now, though, Gibson, he's, he's starting to get cheap enough. Cause like I'm in all these, uh, I've probably done 20, 25 underdog fantasy drafts, like since the NFL draft ended and Gibson's starting to slide, like outside the top 20, even starting to get to wow. the RB, RB2 borderline. Yeah. So like, and that's, that's the thing about him. Like, no, I don't want Gibson in the third or fourth round, but if he starts going in the sixth or something, then we can get him because he has, uh, to your point, that double-digit touchdown upside. But more than anything, man, it's just – McKissick's so involved, and I'm not so sure that he's going to be going away anytime soon. If you just look at last year in the first 12 weeks before McKissick got hurt, I mean, Gibson was the PPR RB17. McKissick was the RB22. And it's just one mm -hmm. of these things where even, you know, 
Gibson just, he needs McKissick to get hurt for him to reach that CMC potential. And damn Ron Rivera, damn Kyle Allen for even putting that thought in our minds in the first place <laughs> uh, and getting our expectations so high. Absolutely. And then, now I wanted to ask you about Washington's offensive line. Are they, would you consider them underrated? Oh, uh, man. You know, I'll be honest in fantasy land. It's, we just haven't seen this massive correlation between offensive line performance and it making this big difference. I think with quarterbacks and went like we saw Burrow as a rookie, like sometimes you just can't overcome it and match with specific situations. That's fine. But you know, people were fading Najee Harris because of the Steelers offensive line last year, you just, there's so much volume, particularly at running back that uh, I just think that it's you're better off not worrying about more times than not, or at least being more of a tiebreaker. So uh, just honestly, I don't have a major opinion on the Washington line. What about if you were to rank the quarterback and wide receiver duos of the NFC East? I got a, ooh. I think McLaurin, based on what he's done, he's right there with eight. I got to give A.J. Brown wide receiver one status. McLaurin two, although C.D. Lamb is fast on that trail. Probably the third, definitely above the Giants. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, that, that's here? easy, right? I think, uh, Probably the third. I think it's too big of a drop off from Wentz compared to uh, Dak, and then I think AJB is just better than Terry. Honestly, like Jalen Hurts gets so much shit as a passer, and he isn't that bad. It's what's so weird about like Hurts and Lamar Jackson. Like they're not great as a passer, but we compare them against these like statues like that can't even come close to doing what they can right. on the ground. And I agree that like it is 2022. You, I think offenses have a higher ceiling if you do have a more of a you know pass first type of quarterback and stuff but man for all of Hurst's limitations last year for them to still be an above average offense and epa and scoring like it's kind of nice having that as your fallback and to Wentz's credit man like when you watch Wentz play like he's gonna you guys we talked about the highlight film like he puts some really good plays on tape but it's almost because like he'll just always try to make those big plays at the right. expense of just taking what's there and taking the easier completion. So maybe uh, maybe third time's a charm for Carson Wentz because, hey, as bad, you know, as bad as he is and people think he is, I, I'd say similar things about Baker Mayfield. Like, right. as, ba as bad as they are, we've seen them be really freaking good for stretches, and there are bad quarterbacks that we have not seen even be <laughs> good for, you know, even if it is eight games or whatever. At least they were able to pull that off. Right. I, I think the perfect moment for Carson Wentz that kind of, speaks to him being like playing hero balls him spraining both his ankles on one play last year <laughs> like that's just such a Carson Wentz thing but uh, just, yeah so it was he had like again the plays are he'll make one just atrocious play a right. week and that's all everyone will end up seeing like he had yeah. the the left-handed interception right. against the freaking Titans but then he leads them right back down the field after that with some great throws to actually force overtime in the first place so right mm. right yeah it's going to be interesting watching Carson this year but uh so anyway back to the Washington defense a lot of people last season where everybody was high on Washington's defense right. I mean they were they were draftable uh the last year of course happened and big old disappointment we were very disappointed in that but uh how do you feel about Washington's defense this year do you think that they're going to have a bounce back do you think we should kind of temper expectations because people are going to saying they're going to be top five again they're going to be I don't know if they'll be that good but they do have some potential so what are you thinking about them man with that just treasure ever growing treasure chest of a uh, first round defensive lineman they have I, I don't see how they can be that bad hopefully Chase Young's recovery um is good enough for him to be out there yeah. and be that beast but like, my God, man, like, for all the good things we say about Chase Young, like, Montez Sweat, like, probably even, like, a freakier specimen, if that's possible. Like, I, I don't know. Like, we're talking about just – First team all world, like walk off the yeah. bus guys uh, between those two. And then obviously Allen and Payne bringing what they have to the table. So I'm kind of team pressure, you know, pass rush over coverage. Uh, we'll see if William Jackson, I thought he was going to have a little bit better uh, first year, but you know, just the way Washington, I think will scheme things up occasionally. Uh, we will Kendall Fuller. They probably are more of a, you know, they kind of need the hole to be greater than one individual uh, piece of it. In terms of, like, fantasy, though, I have always been team last round, if you even need to draft them at all, because it's just the easiest, most streamable position. Uh, we our, our ability to predict defensive performance routinely falls short. And I just think, think playing the schedule uh, is the way to go. So if you guys are ever in a fantasy draft, particularly in, like, July or early August or stuff, like, just take backup running backs if you do not need to draft a kicker or defense, because mm. the, util the utility – you're going to gain even from someone like like a Matt Breida or just some like uh, Boston Scott if you're in just these right. massive deep leagues or something like that guy if God forbid something happens to Miles Sanders or Saquon like all of a sudden they're an actual commodity whereas like Washington defense who the hell knows man right <laughs> that's, a good point. that's a valid point
That's a very valid point. I'm definitely team just stream your defense week by week and kind of play the matchups as well. And get kickers out of fucking fantasy football in general. You know, <laughs> excuse me, but like, my goodness. Like, look, guys, when I used to play ball, I was a linebacker. I, I, I love defense. Like, it is the real football players play on defense. Just get these soccer player part timers that show up to practice for 15 minutes a week. Get out of here. Then they, they they literally take three steps. They kick a ball. It's the most one-dimensional part, and they what they want to be carried off the field when you do your job <laughs> at the end of the game. Like, come the hell on. Most dangerous thing a kicker ever did was celebrating a game winner for the Cardinals. Uh, Grammatica. Was Grammatica, yeah, yeah. Towards ACL. God, what a what white a thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, given what Washington's added as far as, like, weapons in the offseason, you mentioned Jahan Dotson. I do think that Cole Turner might play a, a slightly uh, significant role just because Logan Thomas coming off the injury. I think he'll be using the red zone possibly. Where do you have Washington ranked as far as the NFC East goes? Because obviously Dallas lost Amari, Amari Cooper. Obviously the Eagles add um, A.J. Brown. And, I mean, the Giants are the Giants. We're not going to mention them. But out of those three, where do you kind of got them ranked? With the skill position corpse, you mean? Just like overall, overall. like the NFC East goes, yeah. Yeah, I think they, to me, I think probably Philly should be ranked number one. I mean, just even like Jordan Davis, they made so many damn good moves throughout this entire offseason. We have this absurd streak still going of like no NFC East teams are repeating right. as division champs. So True. I, I do think uh, Washington from top to bottom deserves to be ahead of the Giants. But I think generally, I think Washington and the Giants will be a little more competitive. I can see this being like just one of those classic years where every team in the division has like seven or more wins. And we're just kind of seeing them bounce back and forth a little bit there. So I will say uh, in regards to Turner and this Washington tight end room, like part of what makes their reluctance to give Antonio Gibson a full featured role so damn frustrating is how they give whoever the hell is playing tight end legit 100% of the snaps. Like Ricky Seals. Jones, Logan Thomas, right. freaking John Bates. Like it didn't matter who was out there. They were playing a hundred percent of the snaps and this like doesn't happen in other offenses. So, Hey, Cole Turner, you know, the history of rookie tight ends doing anything is just so small. Kyle Pitts, Evan Ingram, Gronk. Those are the only guys to be top 12 in scoring since 2010. So I'm not expecting much from him, but if Logan Thomas, it starts the year on the pup. If something happens to John Bates, we could be sitting here in week three with Cole Turner getting 100% of the snaps because that's what Washington's going to do, I guess. And now to wrap this up, Ian, I have a couple more questions for you, fantasy-based. Uh, but you were just alluding to John Bates. Let's say, like you said, Logan Thomas starts out in the pup. Do you think Bates is a, a good like a good advice for people to go draft Bates late round as a handcuff? Nah, you don't need to handcuff your tight ends. Not in traditional uh, one mm. tight end league. So nothing against Bates. We kind of saw him have this opportunity last year already, though, and just wasn't really getting featured. I don't think they want to flow the offense to the tight end when you have Dotson and Samuel and those guys uh, hopefully healthy. So long story short, no. <laughs> what about J.D. McKissick? Mm -hmm. Do you think he would be a solid flex play this season? In full PPR, he's okay. He's giving you that nice floor again. I mean, he was a legit low end RB two before right. yeah. uh, he got injured, but needs to be full point PPR. And the only problem with McKissick, you know, Hey, we're trying to, you know, unless you're in a losers, uh, uh, unless you're in one of those leagues, we got to do some embarrassing punishment for coming in last. We really are like first or last, like who gives a shit about second or third. We're trying to hit that home run uh, and go to the moon. Unfortunately for McKissick, like we even saw it last year when Gibson was hurt, like McKissick's role doesn't change really. Like they brought Jarrett Patterson right. up to right. take that early down work. And now with Brian Robinson there, like, I would probably actually rather throw a dart on Robinson late instead of McKissick because if Gibson gets hurt, Robinson's going to be the one flying up draft boards. I don't think McKissick's role really would change. And then uh, last one for you, based like the first five rounds, you know, I have my own theory with doing fantasy football drafts. Let's just say it's a PPR format. What are you doing first, second, third, and fourth, fifth round? Like, what is your order that you would say is probably best bet for you to do? Like running back, running back, wide receiver. What are you doing? all depends that's why some of these people when they just try to stick to a strategy like the best strategy is flowing with what's happening in the draft and taking that's advantage advice, of, right. of guys yeah. falling when they do i will say having done a bunch of these drafts the one theme i'm noticing that's different this year versus last week 
couldn't talk to a single fantasy analyst last summer without them talking about the running back dead zone and how you want to avoid these guys. But all those guys that we were avoiding in rounds three and four, they're going like round six through 10. Now, like if you go on underdog wow. fantasy wide receivers are flying off the board, almost at a two for one rate ahead of wow. these running backs. So honestly, once you kind of get past AJ Brown, like I have Terry McLaurin, like wide receiver 13, 14, he's going outside top 20 for a lot of people, which I really disagree with. So for me, but regardless, I think in that range, like the wide receiver 13 through 24, you can, they're all pretty even and the similar right. things for the running backs. So more than ever now, I'm comfortable trying to get a Kelsey, a Mark Andrews, even a Kyle Pitts in rounds one through three, because okay. it's like, I don't, I don't see the allure of reaching on, you know, uh, DK Metcalf or Michael Pittman when I can just get Terry McLaurin around later, or I can get Travis Etienne a couple rounds later than like uh, Nick Chubb or someone like that. So there's so much running back value, both in the later rounds of drafts and particularly round six through 10, Clyde Edwards, Alaire, Cordero Patterson, Antonio Gibson starting to get there. Like we just have legit starting running backs with fantasy friendly workloads falling to an actual appropriate spot. So one of my favorite sayings, don't hate the player, hate the ADP. We have <laughs> running more running back value than ever right now. Take advantage of it. My man, hey, Ian, real, real fast. Can I ask you one thing about uh, I'm in a defensive league that we uh, IDP. It's three defensive tackles. Or, okay. I'm sorry, three defensive linemen, three linebackers, three DBs. I always have an issue drafting a DB early. What are the type of guys that you should target? You are talking the wrong guy about, wrong guy about that one, but we have yeah. one. At, hey, we have my PFF, John Macri at PFF underscore okay, Macri, cool. one of you. the sharpest yeah. IDP minds out there. Right. There we go. Well, Ian, you're the man. I can't thank you enough for coming in here and joining us. But before you go, if you just like to plug your social media handles, just in case anybody watching wants to come get the best fantasy football advice possible. Appreciate you guys having me, fellas. Always good talking some ball with some fellow diehards. It's June 10th, and we're sitting here just talking about football. I love it. So, uh, yeah, P PFF Fantasy Football Podcast, myself, Dwayne McFarlane. We're doing our team preview series right now through early July, just really going through each and every squad, and we sprinkle that in with some best balls, mailbags. If you want to hear about fantasy football, you know, we will be consistently talking about it. Accordingly, plenty of articles on PFF.com. Find me on Twitter at I heard it's a fun story. One time I, my Twitter account got suspended because I was posting like live highlights. Like as soon as they happen, be in the NFL at their own game, but they decided to take me out, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, when we were trying to get me back on a, uh, on Twitter, like someone was like, yeah, maybe don't have a handle. That sounds like a porno name. So fair <laughs> shots fired a little bit, but you know what? Can't control it. And yeah. So again, good time guys and uh, go watch them. Let's see what happens this year. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Ian. Have a great night, brother. Enjoy your weekend. Appreciate yeah, it. Guys, you too. All right, everybody, we just spoke with this man, Ian Harditz of PFF. That guy was awesome. Oh, yeah. Was, Love that. I, you have no idea how pumped I was when he started talking about uh, Chris Ballard and them talking about yeah. uh, Carson Wentz because I always thought that we were the only people that noticed that. So it's so good to hear other fans be like, what are you doing, man? Just right. Guys, just stop. <laughs> So before we get into our next guest and the fan questions and everything, uh, we got to talk about the latest news surrounding the commanders. Mm -hmm. Jack Del Rio's comments on Monday, well, his tweets, he was responding to a January 6th committee uh, kind of announcement, uh, responded to that, which and then had people responding to him. And then he responded to those people, which got him in more trouble, which got him in front of the microphone. And then when he's in front of the microphone at prac after practice speaking to reporters, he claimed that uh, January 6th was a dust up, which obviously sent a fire, which made everything obviously, I think, worse than it was originally. But I wanted to get your guys' opinions on this because it just came down that Rivera and the Washington Commanders are fining Jack Del Rio $100,000, and that's going to go to the D.C. Police uh, Security Fund, uh, whatever. I don't know, know the actual name. But I wanted to get your guys' opinions on that. Who wants to go first? Doesn't matter. Oh, doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, it's – to me, the whole thing, like, I was expecting Ron to fine him. I, I completely did. And he should be – I mean, I don't – agree with what he said and I, I thought it was just one of those things where i was like dude like why like why are you doing this like and we all know people like that i i think unfortunately like that older boomer generation that like no matter what is gonna put their political opinion or their conspiracy theory in there even if you're at a baby shower you know like they're always <laughs> gonna talk about it but so it's one of those things where like i get it um and i was expecting to find and uh it's just you can't do that like i, I don't like mixing politics in the nfl at the same time people are allowed to have their opinions but they are also allowed to get i, I mean they're allowed to have repercussions for him as well the one thing and i know it i mean it's a thorny issue you know so i'm gonna try to tread lightly here but the one thing that was really weird to me was uh when ron put out the statement and it just and like i completely agreed with everything like he should be fine everything but ron saying that 
the uh he knows he understands the difference between a peaceful protest and that dark day and it was but that, that just because he was wrong doesn't mean that that was a peaceful like the stuff going on there was peaceful protests there for sure and that did a lot but there was also i mean over 20 people died it was a billion to two billion dollars worth of damage and it was just like the, i mean there were some parts of that that were messed up too At the same time jack del rio shut up like the, you can't even compare those two things dude. they're completely different that's not right that's not okay i understand why people were offended about it and it's just a, an, an obnoxious situation i hope it goes away soon yeah the way that i interpreted it you know we kind of talked about it earlier in the week but to me it was almost like a Jack Del Rio was taking more of a stance where it's like civilian versus government, whereas something that happens to civilians uh, where like the businesses get looted and everything, the, the government doesn't really care. But it's not until the government has people raiding their place, their comfort, their comfort zone where they actually do their work. That's when it demands an investigation for them. And I felt like that's what maybe Jack Del Rio was saying, uh, essentially, is like, how come when it happens to us, normal people, it's no big deal. But when it happens to you guys, it's the worst thing to ever happen. And I think that that's the kind of thing that he was putting off. Like, I don't think Jack Del Rio was really que- – I really – I don't know. Like, I'm, I hope he wasn't questioning – the peaceful protests because you know like there were there remember the reports that like there was like pallets of bricks brought out to these protests like right. i would have liked to know who was bringing those out there to destroy people's property you know i yeah. work i work in dc i walked by like the howard the howard theater and stuff and the windows were shattered like what did the theater do why are you throwing windows through that why are you breaking that property it's like a historical site you know and like that's what i kind of go at with like i just would like to know that but I understand why they have to impose the fine because it put Kendall Fuller in an awkward situation because the media was asking Kendall Fuller, uh, yeah. did you hear Jack Rio's comments? Did you see the tweets? And right. Kendall said, no, I haven't yet. And so the guy was like, all right, let me read them to you. Like putting – Going got, up to John Allen and stuff. And like. the players having to be put on the spot like that, I can understand why there would need to be repercussions because you're, you're – what you said, you're free to say what you said, but what you said put a lot of bad light onto the players and put them in an awkward position. And I could understand why that would need to be a teaching moment. And that's what the fine would entail. I would imagine. Hall. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if he didn't, if he would never got, would have never would have got fined and they would have just came out with a statement. And like, we talked about it. His actions are not condoned, whatever, but whatever, whatever the statement said. Then I would have been cool with it. If he gets fined and they send it to the charity, then I'm obviously I'm definitely okay with that. But just my whole, I guess, view on it was first of all, like, why are you going back and forth with someone on Twitter? Like, right. One, you're not one of us. Like, yeah. If you want to go back and forth with someone like a positive, yeah, in a, in a positive note or like even just have conversations back and forth, cool. But like, why are you like, like, why are you baiting and like, why are you making discussions like, why are you bringing a bad light, shedding a bad light on the team in the organization when they're trying to get the bad negative stuff kind of, they're trying to move away from that. And for him to just double down on it, like maybe he just had a bad choice of words. Maybe he just was just in the moment, just kind of like, Oh, I'm defending myself. I got to just see whatever comes to my mind first. But just for me personally, the way I took it was he was like, Oh, well, why you guys keep bringing up the January 6th stuff? Like nothing got burned down and, Nothing was really damaged, but you guys aren't questioning the other stuff. Like, it's kind of just like, you know, like, why are you comparing the two? Like, it's about, it's what aboutism. Like, no one likes what aboutism nowadays, right. especially. So, I understand where they're coming from. Obviously, his, his actions and his words were way out of line. I'm glad that Ron came out and finally said something about it and had a statement out because people were trying to kill Ron about it. Why didn't Ron say anything? Yeah, He's not a disciplinarian and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He's not and, the leader we need. Yeah, exactly. Shout out to Grant because he has the same idea and view that me as. Why would Ron? Why does Ron owe you guys an explanation of what he's going to do to Jack Del Rio? Right. He, if it was a player that did, uh, did something, said something, he would handle it behind closed doors. He would tell the media that, and they move on to the next subject. But so why is it different for a coach? He held. He supposedly he should have handled it behind closed doors. He probably did, but then he put a statement out to kind of double down on it, kind of like Jack Del Rio yeah. down on his statement. So, at the end of the day. Hopefully the statement's out there. We can move away from this. And again, at the end of the day, like you guys said, why are you bringing more questions that are non football to the players and to the organization when it should clearly just be about football right now and winning games? Right. I will say in Jack DeRio's defense in that breath, it's not like he knew that his comments were going to do this, right? Yeah, like he just was – but he, obviously he – sh- 
also, he should have never replied to the quotes we did. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. You didn't have to make it a race thing. He's an idiot and made it to a race thing. So yeah. Right. That that race thing was basically this guy had wrote out like um basically like a, it was a couple of tweets, but essentially the end of it basically said, according to Washington's defensive coordinator, this is what he believes, and Jack quote tweets it and says yeah sure and then has the pinocchio emoji basically saying you're full of crap whatever you believe what you want and i don't think it was like jack agreeing that that's exactly what he felt i think i felt like it was the opposite right, jack was right. saying that's not how i feel you're lying about who i am that's not what i believe in and, and the only thing yeah, is most on the players, internet, you can't read sarcasm right yeah, you but can't read, you that's know? exactly oh. most players that have come out in jack's defense have been like look i don't care what his views are as long as he's out here putting in the work working hard right. and you know, stuff the way we want to be coached, it's all good. So at the end of the day, I'm sure he didn't mean that in like in a racist way, but that's also at the end of the day, like Reese said, it's Twitter. So like, why would you even engage in that comment? That's in the, the thing, man. Boomers don't understand. The internet lives forever. Like, you <laughs> hey, gotta be very. I, I said it. I said it after today. I said it earlier. You know, obviously the fine came down. I just hope that Jack DeRio knows that he still feels that he could say what he wants, but he understands that there are ramifications from that. Like, just like we all should. Because obviously there are. You can't run around saying you're going to bomb the White House. You know what I'm saying? Like You right. can't do stuff like that. We're so going to make a soundbite out of that, Kyle. If you no, just don't do that. that dude. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't do that. No, now they're all going to be coming from my head. But yeah. we are now joined by a huge Commanders fan from across the pond. One that we know very well. Hall's seat neighbor. Seat neighbor seat for buddy. life. Oi! Mr. Scott Hartley from the UK. How are you doing, brother? Yeah, great, Carl. Hi, boys. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to um, get me on here from across the pond. It's obviously been a slow week in Commanderland. So. <laughs> yeah, not much going on. It's crazy. Well, it's nothing happening. It's the end of OTA. So you just thought, you know, I'll get the next best thing to Burroughs on. So, yeah, you know. Hey, hey, you're better. Another dull day in Washington, right? We, we, we always uh, have these dull days, don't we, Scott? Yeah. Uh, but Scott, you know, you messaged me earlier and you kind of wanted to know what was going to be going down in this uh, in this pod episode. You you wanted to know what to be ready for and anticipate. Well, the funny thing is you every week you are so consistent in being able to send us questions for this show that we answer for you. And you always take time out of your day to do that. So we figured that while we have you on here that we'd ask you questions, sir, if that's OK for you. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. No problem at all. Yes. All right, my man. Now, recently, this week, it just got announced that Curtis Samuel and AG were missed practice one day, and it was more due to the fact that they felt tightness, or, and they were being precautious, you could say, Rivera had, had talked about. Are you concerned about Curtis Samuel and AG with these injuries? A little bit. To see him limping across to the side field um, and being told, oh, it was a, it was a hammy. I think for AG, as far as I'm aware. A twinge in his hamstring, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. I am a, I am a bit worried. Um, I'm not, it's not September. So until we see him on the field in September, I'm, I'm not, I'm not fussed. He's looked good throughout the first parts of OTAs. If he's good to go next week in training camp, then it's no issues with me at all. Um, I think I would rather they be cautious um, he's almost like a Ferrari. You know, if you haven't got petrol and you can't afford the petrol to put in the Ferrari, you're not going to take it out of the garage. So just, you know, it, it's one of them. It's still early. It's June. It's not a real issue for me right now. Um, Antonio Gibson, more of an issue if it's a tweak to the hamstring. But again, it's come off the turf toe for a long time. So we've got to, we've got to just let it flow. And it's still early until, until we get to preseason or September. I'm not fussed at all. See, Scott, you didn't need to do any prep. You did perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Scotty, this is a bit of a prediction one. So last year, J.D. McKissick was second on the team in uh, targets, right? So Washington goes out and they figure, hey, we can't have a running back in, in that situation. You know, so we're going to add Jahan Dotson. Curtis Samuel's back. He's healthy. Uh, they, they've got some nice pieces for Carson Wentz to throw the ball around to. Who do you think is second behind Terry McLaurin? We'll say, because Terry should be number one. Who do you think is second on the team in targets this year? Uh. Dotson, Dotson for me, definitely Jahan Dotson. So. Yeah. He's, looked, he's looked fantastic from what I've seen um, and what I've heard. I mean, yeah, he looks really good. I mean, you guys were OTAs, Kyle, you were out there watching. So from nobody said this guy doesn't look like the real deal already. Yeah. Um, we, we still don't know what's going to happen with Terry's contract. So we have to be careful with where what's happening with that. I, I do think he will be second, though. Um, in, in touches. I still think McKissick will be right up there. 
Yeah, I really do. I really do. But it depends. Curtis Samuel, you could argue as well. Are you going to use him as that Debo style back and have him in various different positions so he could get a lot of touches as well? But I do think it's uh, it's Dotson, yeah, for me. Yeah. And just to add on to that, uh, we've talked about like uh, with Logan Paulson and stuff. Wide receivers, it's a different day. Like it used to be wide receivers, it would take them a couple, three years or so to really get going and produce. But now you see wide receivers coming and tearing it up. And it's because they're running routes since they're eight years old. They're, they're yeah. doing all that stuff. So one thing about uh, Dots, I know he has been killing in OTAs. Logan Paulson, it, it went viral basically this week. Logan Paulson saying Jahan Dotson is basically whooping everybody's butt yeah. at corner. I, I Benjamin told him to Saint, say that though. Benjamin St. Juice is the only one that's been able to really keep up with him. But Dots is still doing really well at that. But we also have to remember, at OTAs, they're not allowed to do press coverage or anything like that. It's not physical. And that's one of the one of the weaknesses, uh, you could say, of Jahan Dotson after we drafted him that we had heard was that press coverage, he kind of does struggle with getting off of that. We heard Anthony Armstrong say it. So we do have to be cognizant of that. He, he's not going to be perfect, but he's got stuff to work on, and I'm sure he will. But he has been looking great. Definitely, definitely. So, um, I forgot my question was going to be. Hold hmm. on. My bad. Um, so, oh yeah, so obviously this off season, uh, they've added a lot of pieces to the offense, not so much on the defensive side of the ball. They've brought some guys back like the, like Bobby McCain and, uh, uh, who else did they bring back? I'm just blanking right now. I had a question. Kyle's like, started talking. I was just like, you, um, you want me to take, I can uh, <laughs> my bad, but Scott, if you can remember, what do you think is the best? Washington game you've ever watched? Best one I've watched in recent memory. Um, well, the two that I would say was the RG3 one against the Vikings, obviously yeah. the run. Unbelievable. That's what made me fall in love with the team. I'll be honest with you, it really did. That was like, yeah, this is this is solidly my team. Because I don't know if you know before, um, I had a few American friends. There was a few who, who were military serve, American serving personnel on British military bases. Uh, and we watched various American football games. A lot of my friends followed the Bears or the mm -hmm. Packers. I kind of tagged along with them. And I thought, no, no, I, I want to I see what Washington do. And that's what solidified it for me, watching the draft and seeing RG3. And that game properly solidified. Yep, this is my team. In recent memory, though, you would have to say the the Dallas game um, in Dallas with the and when Montez Sweats played, that, that's yeah. what got me. Batted the ball down in for a touchdown. Thanks for the game. Just remember screaming the house down. I mean, it's three in the morning in the UK, and my wife's going crazy because I woke the kids up. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it, it was that's that in recent memory that game. I think yeah. All right, and then Scott, wrap this up. Last one I have for you. You're going to stick with us for the last this episode. But my last question for you. What is it like to be a Commanders fan over in the UK? Because I've heard you guys talk like you can't get the same radio stations at us. Getting merchandise to you guys is very, very hard as well. And then talk about like what times you're watching games at what time in the morning. You oh, would never yeah. guess either because you guys are always on top of everything. Yeah. Like, you guys always know everything. So, <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that, Reed. No, we, it's, it's, we get the same access TV-wise to you guys. I mean, honestly, I can go downstairs and watch Good Morning Football. Hmm. You know, we've got the NFL Network, uh, Game Pass is, you know, worldwide now. So we watch that. Obviously, we've got the international series as well, um, which is really, really popular. I tweeted you guys earlier, not to see the Broncos fan who was putting it out there, in amongst loads of Seahawks fan. It was to see the stadium. You know, every, every game that we have out here is 90,000 people, you know. Wow. Packed out. I can promise you that there is fans from every single team, you know, irrespective of it is. Commanders, we have a really large fan base. And this, I think, goes back to the Channel 4 days. We used to only have one radio station that you would get, uh, sorry, one TV station. You'd probably get about an hour's worth of American football on through the 90s um, and the late 80s. And the rest of it came from either military certain personnel mm -hmm. on V8 videos, or you'd wait a week and get the scores and the breakdowns and the statistics. But you'd have to wait a week for that newspaper to come out. And now, obviously, with the age of the internet, it's a worldwide game and it's 24-7. I mean, we wouldn't have met you guys through Twitter and right. talking on podcasts like this. You can keep as up-to-date as you can with most of it. VPN is your friend, which is amazing. Um, so, obviously, I have a VPN, you know, to listen to the radio stations and things that you guys listen to as well. Okay. Um, 
we don't like the we don't like the late games. So you know, one o'clock on a one o'clock on a Sunday is absolutely fantastic for me. That's six p.m. my time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I mean, right now we're at what are we, just after 11 o'clock, right. um, in the evening. So, um, yeah, you know, it, the, the game against the steel uh, Pittsburgh was a real, real late one for us. Uh, the draft day super bowls really late. Um, got a shout out Burroughs to, for organizing the draft day party. I mean, yes, there was what, I think it was 11 commanders. 11 of us went up to, to Edinburgh and got together, which was fantastic. You know, um, people like Scouse and you, I know contributes very, very well to your podcast as well through the discord server. Yep. You know, he always there as well. You know, when it, it always puts your hand up and says guys and the community is growing bigger. Um, the game is growing exponentially in the UK. It's, it's huge. Um, obviously football as in soccer, our, our football is always going to be king. And then you have other um, other other games around that, but it's really tribal in that respect. But politically, race, color, creed, gender, ethnicity, whatever it may be, we we all get together with with the NFL and with the Commanders. So it's fantastic. I've met a lot of good people through it, and um, yeah, long may it continue. My man, I appreciate it. Thank you, because a lot of us don't really understand what goes into it for a fan like yourself. Because, you know, like draft night, you're up at 2 in the morning just to see who we draft. 3 a.m. sometimes, you know? Well, night one, we got back at, we got back at, literally got kicked out of the casino at 5 to 6 in the morning. And we've been there from 8, 8, 8 p.m. The, the previous evening. So, <laughs> really long. You missed the last two picks. So, wow. yeah, crazy. Absolutely. Now let's move on to our fan questions to wrap up this show. And I'll start this with you, Hall. This is from the Colonel. Anticipating the loss of Deron Payne, what measures should the front office be taking to ensure we get maximum trade value instead of just franchising him or letting him walk with no compensation? Um, honestly, I think the maximum trade value window is already passed by and probably really? closed. By now, yeah, I don't think that he's tradable. I mean, they could obviously trade him during the offseason. It's like someone gets hurt. Obviously, he might become a hot commodity. But as of right now, I think that he's more of an asset for the team as opposed to not on the team. Obviously, they drafted Mathis, so I definitely think that uh, he's going to be a big contributor. But we also lost two defensive tackles that were in the rotation. You add one into the draft that's through the rotation. So you got to keep that rotation strong, especially as much as they like to rotate the defensive line. So... Uh, yeah, I would definitely just say that Payne will probably play this year. I don't think they're going to franchise him next year. I think he plays this year, and then we get the comp pick most likely in the draft, uh, whatever year that might be. Yeah, you you answered it perfectly fine for me. Um, you're right because that comp pick is obviously there. If he were to walk and Washington doesn't do a lot in free agency after he walks, they could get that third-round comp pick based on the kind of contract he gets from a new team that he goes to. But I loved your point about him being more valuable to the team this year rather than trading him because then you would have Federi Mathis starting without much depth there, right? And just with those three guys, you are kind of concerned about depth already. So it wouldn't make sense to trade him at this point. So I do under I do agree with you, Hall, that the comp pick is probably the best compensation and the trade window already passed. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. I think is it a third round pick comp pick that you're gonna get? Yeah, third or a fifth, fourth. So yeah, I agree with that. I think we have got good Depth. I want to see how David Barden, um in preseason whether going to make it in the game or not. But from what I've heard, he's doing well. Another international player, guy. So I'll always look out for them as well because we we've, we've watched that story for two years, so we, we know what he's going to be like. Um, and then you've got, still got James Smith Williamson, who's behind as well as a rotational piece. I am absolutely gutted that we lost my guy, Matt. Big, big Matt the Greek. Um, I, re I had to reorder my jersey, so yeah, not not ideal. But it, it, it is what it is. But I agree with you, Hall. I think the the time has passed already for Jerome Payne, unfortunately, and I think we're just going to get that comp pick and move on. What about you, Reed? Do you got anything to add? No, not really. I mean, you guys basically all fit on that, yeah, unfortunately. All right, now let's move to Twitter for our next question. This is from Commander OC Orange Crush ninety two. Reed, let's talk pets. How many have you had or have? Who were they, and what are your favorite animal friends of choice? Ooh, well, huge Ace Ventura guy, first of all, so love that. Love that for us. Um, Got one little pet right here. He's a little menace or a newt or something. <laughs> uh, always had pets growing up. Always had dogs. We've had dogs for a long time. And uh, right now, we have a chihuahua and a Boston Terrier. Uh, 
they're Oliver and Edgar. They're sweet little puppies. Uh, you know, they poop a lot and they smell a lot, but love, love, love animals. Hate snakes. Uh, they can all go die, burn. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm a dog guy. You know, you, you would be. You look like a Chihuahua guy. You know, like do you I like. Know? Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, no, I carry them around in the airport and stuff. I know you do. You definitely do. What about you, Scott? How many, how many pets do you have, and what are they? And then, what are your favorite animal friends? Favorite animal friends be a dog. I'm a dog. I'm a, I am a dog guy. Um, I don't have any pets at the moment, though. Um, I am ex-military, so I've moved around an awful lot um, with two children as well. So now we are. I'm, I'm out of the services, and we're stable. We will be looking to get a, a pet in the future. We just haven't really had the time to to go out and get, and get a dog. I'd look at a rescue or or, or something. Um, to to get a dog that way um i don't want to be paying thousands of pounds for some breed that you know my wife thinks is fluffy like of a little ache but um we'll we'll see but yeah i'm a, I'm a dog guy so growing dogs so that's that's what we'll do yeah absolutely dogs, can you tell a dog's bark in the uk does it sound british is it like <laughs> yeah oh it's my oh, yeah rough, yeah. <laughs> rough. <laughs> Rough mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, uh, for me, uh, we have three dogs currently. Uh, their first dog was Bandit. Uh, when my wife and I first lived in our apartment in Frederick. You could only have a pet under 40 pounds, and we wanted to be able to find a dog that was small enough but could guard uh, the house in, in case I wasn't there or anything like that. And obviously, Bandit is a Jordan, a German Shepherd mix. Uh, he's uh, my he. That's my boy, man. And then I'm we German. have two. And then two other dogs, which is actually my wife's brothers. Uh, so they're basically rescues. We took them in um, after a while being with them. But one is a pit bull. His name's Odin. He's the nicest dog in the world, but he is so dang annoying. He'll never bark at another dog, but he'll bark at you when he's, like, hungry or needs to go outside. So he's the weirdest dog in the world. I have no idea. And then Koa is, like, anxiety-ridden. Uh, she's I like to say that she has severe, severe anxiety, uh, like that kind of, like, old woman typical kind of thing. And uh, she's always flipping out, but she's a protector, dude. She's a bad uh, girl. She, she'll whoop up any of the boys. She'll destroy them. But then we have two cats as well, uh, Rain and Lily. Rain was found outside, and then he just decided to come inside and then became an inside cat. Uh, he's Me and him, I'm not a cat guy. I didn't grow up with cats, but him and I have a good relationship. You know, we just stay away from each other. I feed him. And he keeps, he leaves me alone. You both sit on top of the fridge and knock stuff over. Right. Yeah. We have a good relationship. He's like a dog though. Like he, like right. and when the morning, when the dogs eat, like he'll go up and start eating out of his bowl when the dogs are eating. He, he's a very weird cat. Jesus, Kyle Irwin, you running a zoo over there? Dude, seriously. I, don't, I mean, it basically is. Yeah. Including <laughs> me. What about you, Hall? Uh, you. yeah. Um, I've always been like a dog guy and I have a dog myself. He's not physically here. Like at my house, like right now he actually lives like literally two minutes around the corner from where I live at, at my mom's house. But uh, yeah, he's a pit bull and boxer mix. He's a big old 90 pound behemoth. His head is about probably 60 pounds of his uh, weight. But uh, yeah, uh, his name is Jameson. Love him. Uh, I kind of grew up with dogs. Like I grew up, uh, I was always, I never really grew up in my grandparents' house, but I was at my grandparents' house a lot growing up. And uh, it's kind of like, the country, if you want to call it that, because there's a lot of open space out there and like out in Darnstown. If you're from Montgomery County, you know where you know about Darnstown. Yeah. Yeah. So my uncle would hunt back in the woods that my grandparents owned. I owned like five acres out there. And he had beagles that he would take out to hunt. So I had like mm. my job growing up was I like, go feed the dogs and I would like play with them, stuff like that. So I've always been a dog guy. Uh, like I said, I have a dog. I got my mom a cat for her birthday a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, I'm not really a cat guy, but if it's a nice cat and it's like willing to like be petted, cool. But most of the time, I don't trust them. So, uh, have, but, you ever, uh, have you ever seen Joe Dirt? Of course. Who hasn't seen Joe uh, Dirt? You remember when he gets adopted at one point when he was a kid and the guy yeah. takes him out duck hunting and he comes yeah. out of water with a dog? And I imagine that's Hall. Like one morning, yeah. the dogs are. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I will say, our, the dog, our dog. Edgar, I'm 98% sure that in like back in like the 1800s, he was once like in a colony in New England and got turned into a dog because he like understands people. So like sometimes he'll bark at us and we're like, that's dude, he gets it. He's a person. He's stuck in there. He's been stuck in there since the 1800s because of some witch and she's dead now. and can't reverse the curse. So, oh, dude, what a storyline that would be, right? Yeah, that's like, no. there you go. Yeah, no, it's, make a movie it's real, though, that. I think. Yeah, no, it's called Hocus Pocus. I, was gonna yeah, say I know, that. I know, I know. <laughs> Scott, that, that's the whole point of the joke, Reed. Uh, all right, so Scott, our next question is from Twitter. This is from Rod Diff. Do you think 
do you guys think that we have two top 10 units? I, he says, I do feel like our talent is ready to step up. Yeah, I saw this question earlier on Twitter, so thanks for bringing that one in. Um, it, I don't think we'll have two top 10 units. I think we'll have one top 10 unit on the defense. I do think that has to step back up. And I do think it's worthy of being a top 10, but I don't think the offense will be top 10. I think it'll be there or thereabouts. Maybe it'll be top 15, definitely. But I don't think it'll be top top 10. I think we'd be just short of But what I, what I do think we'll see is we'll see a massive uptake on the offense and a total difference in that, which will make people think, oh, yeah, that is a really good unit. But I do think we'll just be a little bit shy. Yeah, I would, I would say that, that they have the potential to be, uh, without a doubt. It's, I think the biggest variable that has to do with them being a two top 10 unit is health to be perfectly honest uh, and being able to come back healthy and stay healthy consistently they can't continue having these really bad injuries at bad times when they cannot afford them uh and like we had with Antonio Gibson JD McKissick all the way down the line uh so health is the biggest issue thing for me but yes they have the potential to be to- two top 10 units what do you think Reed uh yeah no I mean they definitely have the potential I mean all signs right now that they're saying that the of course, look, of course, the coaching staff and, and stuff are, are high on their guys. That's why they have them uh, and they're banking their jobs on them. But uh, they say that they think that they can have a top 12, 13 offense in this league easily. I mean, they really like them. And I could see that. I really could. I could see Carson Wentz making a huge difference. I won't let myself get too excited, though. I'll say that they'll finish just like you right outside the top 10. But I do expect defense to turn things around uh, because the easier schedule, they're not facing a murderer's row of quarterback. Chase Young in year three is going to be out of the the. Uh, the sophomore slump and it's just you could see these guys start to turn around individually once they start playing together uh you know and hopefully they don't get into any dust ups with jdr over there calling the plays and uh you know but no i think they'll be fine they should be pretty good they're good as long as they're healthy what about you all um yeah i'm gonna try to be realistic normally the homer would maybe be like yeah but i think that the offense while it's going to be a step up from what we've seen in the past I think it jumps up maybe like 10 spots. So I got them outside the top 10, maybe like between 13 to like 15, 16 range, which is still top half of the league, which I'll take that any day of the week compared to what we have in the past couple of years. And defensive wise, while I do think they're going to jump back up, I do have kind of tempered expectations because I want to see it. Cause like obviously everyone last year had so much expectations and then they didn't come out and they came out flat and just disappointed everyone. So I don't want to see them show and prove it first, but if they play like the the bottom tiers, the Jaguars, the Texans, if they beat up on the teams that they're supposed to beat up on, I definitely think they can be top 10, but I'll say they'll be right outside the top 10, maybe the 11, 12 range also. I got you. Now, Hall, let's keep it with you for Jeff Miles' question out of the Discord chat server. We talk about the few good memories we have with this franchise often. Who on the current team do you see creating a wholesome good memory for the next 30 years? In what play form? For example, Sean Taylor diving for the pylon or RG3 off to the races against the Vikings? That is a great question. Man. I think it's going to be... You know what? I'm going to go with... I think it's going to be a deciding playoff game, like a deciding get into the playoff type game, maybe even deciding win the division type game. Maybe it's week 18 against Dallas at home. I think that Jahan Dotson, the rookie, for all the the post-draft like hate that he got because he got overdrafted and he wasn't this high on people's board and no one knew really who he was because – uh, Mel Kuyper, Tom McShay didn't have them mocked to us and stop, stop, no one knew stop. much about him. Everyone was all up in arms and pissed. I think that he comes out, shows and proves this year, has a great rookie year compared to most rookie years for wide receivers here. But I think he makes a crucial play in week 18 for us to beat Dallas. And that's either going to get us into the playoffs or it's either going to get us to win the division. I think he gets a go ahead touchdown to seal the deal week 18 against Dallas. Um, Jeff, this is a great question for the next 30 years. I'll say it's Carson Wentz Monday night against the Eagles uh, throws a bomb late in the game for a touchdown for them to win. And then the in the post game, like that kind of build up, the players will respond to that, you know, because this is like for Carson in a way, like his kind of retribution. They won. And that could be the turning point 
for the season where like the team feels like a team, like they're all one unit, like fighting for one another. And I feel like that moment of them, like maybe giving them the game ball or celebrating on the field could be something that's remembered for 30 years on down the road. Is that Carson Wentz game Monday night against the Eagles getting his revenge and our revenge at the same time. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I'm going to stick to Hall almost and look at the look at next season. You, you just imagine now, you imagine the scenario. Everyone's, everyone's, Right. We're in the stands. It's week 18. We need a win to make the playoffs, win the division. We're playing Dallas. There's four seconds to go on the tick. And up steps, massively jacked. Joey Sly, ready. He's there. Kicks the winner. The, it goes, the crowd goes wild. Unbelievable scenes. Beer goes everywhere. I'm covered in beer. Seat neighbours are jumping around. We're loving life. Joey Sly for me. Franchise kicker. He's here for the next 10 years. Signs a $40 million contract. Yeah, that's my man. <laughs> yeah. I, I love all Sorry, this. Sorry, I went so, wild. <laughs> I would be so pumped for that, for any of these. I'm going to go on the other side of the ball, though. I'm going to go on defense, and uh, I'm going to bring up the dynamic duo of our pass rushers that everybody always seems to be forgetting about whenever we're talking about Washington. It seems like everybody's so focused on Carson Wentz in this offense that they forget that we got two young athletic freak studs on the outside on rushing the passer. So I'm going to say, hey, Chase Young and Montez Sweat, are when we – we're going to fall a little bit. You know what happens every yeah. season. We're, we're going to we're gonna go on a little losing streak. Something's going to happen, whether it's injuries, whatever, what have you. And then when we're going to face the Giants the first time, you're going to see Chase Young and Montez Sweat turn it up against these young tackles, and they're going to dominate them. And then we have the bye week, and then we come back against the Giants, and they're going to beat them into the ground again. There's nothing they're going to do to stop them. And then that's just going to start a run, and we're just going to build, and then eventually we're going to make the playoffs because those two dominant pass rushers finally filled up to form. And that's my prayer because I don't want either one of them to be busts. You know, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Well, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. Scott, I wanted to thank you. I wanted this to be kind of like a whole thank you to you because of all of all your support that not only you give to us in this pod, but everyone on Twitter and then also the commanders, you know, being in the UK, it's awesome that you guys are over there and care this much about football, man. And obviously the commanders doing everything you guys do, staying up late, being so invested like you are, I, I really do appreciate you, brother. And uh, I really am looking forward to when you guys come over week one so we can actually celebrate like we're being supposed to for the past two years and go yes. watch Washington get a W. Definitely, 100%. That's my first live game, so I'm not getting on a plane for eight hours to watch us lose. You, so this goes out and anyone's watching from the team, Ron Rivera, I ain't traveling for eight hours to, to watch us lose. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm looking forward to Seeing you guys so thanks for having me on again really appreciate it keep doing your thing you've got me a lot of stuff i've told you this personally before you know covid was bad for all of us but it's things like this and even though we're five thousand miles apart over over an ocean you know it feels like we're brothers all of us do you know what i mean and the, the family the whole podcast network everybody that's involved in the in twitter sphere thanks to all of you or yeah whatever goes on on the field you know it's all team isn't it it's all about this team we're there for absolutely scott you're the man dude i can't thank you enough you're like a, a brother to us basically how much we interact and talk on twitter and everything all right everybody we will see you guys on monday make sure you have a good safe weekend enjoy this beautiful weather we'll see you then i'm kyle can't wait to enjoy a, a beer with you come september my fellow seat neighbor for life i'm hall yeah, and uh, Hall's mic didn't cut out this episode. Good for you. I know. I was just okay. thinking that, too. It was crazy. It could have cut out when he wasn't talking, but we just didn't realize it. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. But, Hall, this was a monumental and milestone episode for that. That's pretty freaking cool, man. for 30 years right here. <laughs> Absolutely. Scott, you're the man, dude. Really do appreciate you, brother, and all your support. You are the absolute man. We'll see you guys on Monday, everyone. Be safe. Washington football. Woo! Oi! <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football.